Now I'm thrilled to introduce today's uh, presenter and, and speaker, Bill Doan. Bill is a past president of the Association for Theater and Higher Education and a fellow in the College of Fellows of the American Theater. Bill has co-authored three books, written several plays, and multiple scholarly articles. His current work includes a new performance, Frozen in the Toilet Paper Isle of Life. Part <laughs> Boy, you know what? I feel like I've been there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, part of a larger project titled The Anxiety Project. Work from this project includes multiple short graphic narratives published in the Annals of Internal Medicine and Graphic Medicine. He is a professor of theater in the College of Arts and si Architecture and is the artist in residence for the College of Nursing. Doan is serving as Penn State's laureate for the fiscal year 2020. Please join me in welcoming today's huddle expert, Bill Doan. Okay, testing. Everybody hear me okay? Great, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity to be here with you. This is sort of the official launch of the, my laureate year. Uh, so you're my, you're my uh, lab animals, my, the test on my talk. Um, so we'll see how this goes. And at the end, I, the last slide is a website I've created for the year, uh, a Penn State website, <laughs> where you can also log on and leave comments about today. And in fact, one of the things that I want to start with um, to, to put on the page my mom will never believe I did this so I got to have some evidence um, so I've lived much of my life with anxiety and depression and it's possible that I always will I mean I'm 60 years old after all and they don't appear to be going anywhere, but I'm okay. I'm okay because I ask for help when I need it, and I take the help I'm offered. Anxiety and depression and all the negative feelings that can accompany them, fear, anger, rage, isolation, self-doubt, hate, shame, what a list, right? Sounds like it's coming right off of the evening news. They require you to shut down and isolate yourself, whereas vulnerability, on the other hand, requires you to stay connected. Perhaps one of the reasons I've always stayed part of the theater. Requires you to stay connected, to have empathy for others, but being vulnerable is hard work. It's the hardest work I've ever done. Vulnerability is the art of allowing oneself to be seen without pretense and without the masks we wear to get through our day. And it can be a terrifying proposition for someone who has mental health challenges, but it can also be an antidote to them. The fact is, vulnerability has very real consequences for the way we judge ourselves and others. Vulnerability, when it matters, we're less likely to judge people based on their circumstances. When vulnerability matters, we don't assume that every person living with a mental health issue is somehow less than, or dangerous, or deficient. Only when vulnerability matters can we intervene in a world where those who think they are invulnerable seem to show little restraint at how badly they treat the vulnerable. Thanks. <laughs> Anxiety disorders have been identified as the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults age 18 and over. It's not uncommon for someone with an anxiety disorder to also suffer with depression or vice versa. One is often referred to as the other's twin. Nearly one half of those diagnosed with depression are also diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. 17 million adults had a major depressive episode last year. And the number for children, even more staggering. 17 million adults had a major depressive episode last year, and I was one of them. But let me back up just a little bit, because on some level, anxiety and even a deep, sustained sadness, say after a loss or after an extended illness, 
are a natural part of being human. We all experience both. I mean, anxiety is like an early warning system that tells us there's potential danger somewhere, that we need to be prepared to protect ourselves. And for most of us, that feeling passes. But for some of us, we can become locked into a fight or flight mode. This is uh, a piece I did for the Annals of Internal Medicine that explains the physiology of panic, what actually happens in the brain to the, the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, uh, and the ways in which the body physiologically responds to anxiety. Um, and I discovered while working on this research and creating this graphic narrative piece for the internals of, internals of medicine that my average, when I had them, my average panic attack actually lasted about 12 and a half minutes before my body would sort of return to normal. Let, for, let me give you an example from my own life. And this is, as we say in rural Ohio, a true fact, all right? So one day I find myself frozen in the toilet paper aisle at Walmart. I mean, I love grocery shopping, don't get me wrong, I like to cook, I like to pick out the ingredients, I like to do that for my family. But if you're in the grip of an anxiety attack, a big store like that is just glaring lights and throngs of people grabbing cereal, personal hygiene products, dairy, dairy-free, dairy substitute products. I mean, I'm like a deer in headlights. And the toilet paper aisle is like a quarter of a mile long, right? <laughs> and I'm completely overwhelmed by all the styles, plies, textures, brands. My eyes run up and down the aisle, right to left, left to right, frantically scanning for something to make sense, for a reason to reach out and grab a four pack, six pack, eight pack, a lifetime supply of two ply, one ply, good God, smooth, lotion infused. I look at my watch. I've been standing in the toilet paper aisle of Walmart for five minutes and my feet won't move. So I pull out my phone and I call my wife. Hello? Where are you, she asks. I'm, I'm in the toilet paper aisle. I can't decide, I can't choose, I can't remember what we use. What are you talking about, she says. I don't know what to do. I mean, I asked my butt, my butt said it doesn't give a crap. And I said, look, you're being such an ass. Then I noticed people are looking at me. Please, tell, help me, tell me what to buy. Two ply, she says, matter of factly. My wife is nonplussed because you see, we've been here before. If you're gonna make art about living with anxiety and depression, you have to take a long, hard look over your shoulder at your past. But I wanted to know how I could do that without judging myself, without judging my family, others, or even the social circumstances that weren't of my own making. And I ask this because there's nothing to be gained by blaming. But for me, there was no moving forward without an honest look at the varied and complicated events that brought me to this confession. And that's what it feels like to talk about living with anxiety and depression, a confession, a stripping away of a layer of protection to tell the truth about yourself that once seemed a humiliation. Sharing what it's like to live with anxiety and depression is a bit like undressing in front of strangers, which I'm not gonna do, by the way. <laughs> But how to confess, right? How to tell this story. I mean, I tried doing it in my head, rehearsing my confession like I used to do as a boy. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. But in fact, for a long time, hiding the truth about my anxiety and depression was one of the ways I survived. So when it was time to come out of hiding, I didn't know how. I mean, vulnerability is basically about risk and emotional exposure. So I thought, well, maybe I should try writing a letter. I sat for days in front of a blank page because I couldn't remember the last time I'd actually written a personal letter and not an email. And I needed to start somewhere. So, dear family and friends, I know it would be difficult for you to believe I've battled anxiety and depression most of my life. I hope this letter will help explain why you probably had no idea what I was hiding. 
How could you have known? You see, I was an expert at keeping my secret. I would laugh a lot. My laughter was fake as often as it was honest. I knew that laughing and smiling were key to hiding the truth. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not that I never felt happy or experienced joy. It's that I figured out how to use a smile or a laugh to mask when I was feeling anxious or depressed. Over time, I developed an advanced ability to pretend everything was all right. This is what made it possible for me to show up for social events, for work, for whatever was required. I mastered fake it till you make it. Once I was present, I could often find a way to enjoy myself for a time, but the cycle of dreading having to be somewhere, followed by regret, anger, or feeling guilty was exhausting. I felt like the whole world was going one way and I was going another. But I knew I had to keep moving. Pretending became lying, which became telling people what I thought they wanted to hear. I could pretend my way through almost any situation by lying to myself, convincing myself I was the problem. And who was going to believe me anyway, right? I mean, from all outward appearances, I'm a confident, self-possessed person who's had success both personally and professionally, and I'm grateful for all of that. But the mental and physical costs of a life lived with sustained bouts of anxiety and depression came due at one point, and they were substantial. Inside, I was slowly dying. As I got older, I grew angrier, and as I grew angrier, I grew more desperate to keep what I was feeling inside. Sometimes I thought my brain was on fire, and it became increasingly difficult to keep all this hidden and to not take it out on those I love the most. I know this letter has only scratched the surface of how to think about let alone understand the complexity of what's involved here. So how can you be expected to understand family and friends? What I do know is that it's no longer possible for me to pretend I don't live with anxiety and depression. My mental health, my well-being requires me to tell the truth, especially to myself. That's how the original letter ended, but I knew I hadn't really reached the heart of the matter, which was to find a way to live vulnerably and honestly, even if it means living my entire life with anxiety and depression as my companions. You see, all mental health issues are more complicated than we want to admit. Causes and effects are as varied as the people who have them. There are 22 sections of criteria and codes in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders for anxiety alone, including two other categories. In terms of my own anxiety and depression, I just assumed I was the problem. I was somehow different, inferior, weird. At least that was the message I thought I was getting from friends, from family, and even teachers who used to tell me, you're, an, you're odd, <laughs> you know, right? It never occurred to me that there might be other factors involved, like the expectations of masculinity, like what was going on in my brain, or the influence of socioeconomic status, like religion or some interplay among all those things. You see, I grew up in what I like to call the mixed dirt of working and lower middle class cultures, hourly wages, faltering unions, and unemployment. Most of the kids I went to school with came from a home struggling with some combination of divorce, addiction, domestic violence, hunger, anger, and psychological abuse. I thought this was the way of the world. It never occurred to me that these could be factors in my own struggles with anxiety and depression because it was what I knew. But these were the things that were also making me resilient, which is something I didn't understand at the time. In 2017, the United Nations concluded that the dominant biomedical narrative around anxiety and depression is based on selective and potentially faulty research. 
They claim that power imbalances and inequalities are where we need to focus if we want to understand the ever-increasing number of anxiety and depression sufferers worldwide. Low socioeconomic status individuals have much higher odds of, odds of being depressed. I can't help but think about this from both a personal and a larger human perspective. The privilege I've enjoyed in my adult life is a stark contrast to the world's impoverished and marginalized people and to much of my own childhood. I've done quite a bit of work on American working class issues and that work always leads me back to questions about how socioeconomic status can impact one's mental health. My Irish, Italian, Catholic, Appalachian, hard-working roots run deep. My maternal grandparents never owned their own home until after my grandfather died, when my grandmother was able to buy a mobile home and move into a trailer park. My mother worked for years as a cashier, a waitress, a school bus driver, before completing her GED and working her way up to her final job as a drug and alcohol rehab counselor, the first job that ever provided her with her own health care. We were a working class family. Sometimes we had enough, and sometimes we made do with what we had. There were underlying tensions and unspoken pressures that I didn't understand, but I felt them. I felt the fears, anxieties, frustrations, and frequent shame that came from unemployment, the realities of divorce, and the looming cloud of an alcohol-fueled rage from a stepfather who just scared the hell out of me. Again, don't get me, oh, that little drawing up in the corner, one day my brother and I were hunting with my stepfather and I shot too soon and almost blew his head off with a shotgun. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Um, yeah. <laughs> so don't get me wrong, again, there was a lot of extended family love. I, this isn't like a play the sad violin for Bill story. Um, if it were, I couldn't be standing up here as the Penn State Laureate. But I felt these underlying tensions. I felt the fears. I felt the anxieties. There was always this Sisyphus-like rhythm of pushing the rock of working class struggle up the economic hill, only to watch it roll back over the men and women who were the central figures of my childhood. Everything was coated with the dust of melancholy. I first came across the term straddler in Alfred Lubano's book, Limbo, Blue Collar Roots, White Collar Dreams. His description of the inner conflict for those raised in a blue collar home but now living a white collar life really resonate with me. See, I had created two identities for myself, but I didn't really feel like either one was authentic. And being caught between them was also a problem I had with the rules of being a man. Scholars call it hegemonic masculinity, the more popular term toxic masculinity, is a phrase defining the, tr tr the traditional male ideal as being stoic, tough, and aggressive. The body is an instrument of violence in this rationalization, and so to opt for self-preservation over physical brutality often opens one to ridicule and shame. Look at what happened in social media to Andrew Luck when he decided to step down to, out of self-preservation and the number of people that went after his masculinity. Growing up, I was surrounded by many men who thought they were invulnerable. Men who were, in fact, I think, just overwhelmed by their vulnerability and unable to deal with it. One of my first jobs other than bailing hay, was washing cars at a local gas station. Now, the worst cleaning job I ever had was, uh, was on the local hearse, which also doubled as the local ambulance, which gives you a sense of how small the town I was. So a guy I knew died of suicide by placing a shotgun in his mouth and pulling the trigger. When they brought the vehicle in for me to wash it, I had no idea what was going on. 
They had pretty much cleaned it out after the hospital run, but once inside, I did discover a couple of blood stains, what I thought was a small chip of bone. I could hear the driver talking about what happened, and I could see everything he described, how they scooped the bits of brain and skull and bloody chunks of hair and placed them in plastic bags, how they put the plastic bags of stuff up by his head, or what used to be his head, just as if it was the natural and logical thing to do, as if somehow they could put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But you know what really bothered me about this? was that I could understand why someone might do this. I wouldn't, but at 16 years old, I could understand why someone would. Was I messed up in the head? Was there something wrong with my brain? Was I wired wrong? You see, I've always been a bit obsessed with the brain. It's been a kind of a love-hate relationship with me, because I could never find the off switch for my own brain, for one thing. Brain chatter about everything. But mostly this endless form of relentless self-criticism, you should have said this, you should have done this, you're useless, what an idiot, can't you do anything right? Or the brain chatter of worry, because I just knew something bad was going to happen. I read everything I could find to try and understand the link between anxiety, depression, and the brain. What was wrong with my brain? I read about changes to neurotransmitter function, synaptic function, neuron disruption in the amygdala. I read about parts of the brain I didn't even know existed. I even researched brain jokes. Want to hear one? <laughs> what did the frontal say to the parietal? I lobe you. I didn't write it. <laughs> Charles, don't look at me like that. <laughs> so I also read about serotonin levels, right? The new research that says maybe serotonin levels don't have anything to do with anxiety and depression. But serotonin reuptake drugs still work. So what does that mean? And is the neurogenic hypothesis Correct. Prolonged anxiety and depression are linked to lasting changes in the brain, but precisely how is open to interpretation. And perhaps that's why we have so many words for people living with mental health issues, though most of them only serve to stigmatize. A few of my favorites that I was called growing up, crazy, mad, loony, uh, you know, these were the ones that I heard over and over. Oh, you're such a head case. My brother used to tell me that all the time. God, you're such a head case. According to science, cell by cell, atom by atom, parts of the brain change physical shape to accommodate and fit anxiety and depression. In particular, it appears these areas of the limbic system can actually shrink, which suggests that the function of these areas of the brain can also shrink perhaps even create a reduction in empathy. I wonder how much of that we seem to be seeing lately. The medical explanations for anxiety and depression are as complicated as the social and personal reasons. At first, I went down the rabbit hole of each one, trying to figure out you know, whether it was childhood, genetics, class, gender, race, culture, what deep dives into each, looking for the one thing I could call the reason for my anxiety and depression. I just knew my brain felt like this flying circus of neuronal signals endlessly repeating, my amygdala always standing guard, waiting for the next thing to go wrong. The fact is, there are many possible causes for anxiety and depression, including faulty mood regulation by the brain, genetic vulnerability, stressful life events, medications, etc. It's believed that several of these factors, at least, interact to bring this on. Certainly, chemicals are involved in this process. But it's not a simple matter of one chemical being too low and another being too high. There are millions, even billions of chemical re reactions that make up the dynamic system responsible for our mood, perceptions, and how we experience life. And researchers have learned much about the biology of depression, and they've identified genes that make individuals more vulnerable to low moods. 
And while we know more than ever before about how the brain regulates mood, our understanding of the biology of depression is far from complete. Popular lore has it that emotions reside in the heart. Science, though, tracks the seat of our emotions to the brain. Researchers believe that more important than levels of specific brain chemicals, nerve cell connections, nerve cell growth, and the functioning of nerve circuits have a major impact on anxiety and depression. And those things are also connected to connection, to connecting to other human beings, to empathic relationships. Still, our understanding of the neurological underpinnings of mood is also incomplete. So it seems to me we need to be careful about when we pathologize mental illnesses with people and how we pathologize them. Interestingly, the histories of thinking about, writing about, and understanding anxiety and depression are embedded in our other histories of expression, poetry, prose, drawing, painting, dancing, in addition to science. I mean, we even find them in prayer and spiritual longing. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I can't help but remember my own Irish, Italian, Catholic childhood. My obsession with fears, with demons, with purgatory. And the desert monks that I read about, like Cassian, the 4th century mystic, whose writings describe depression as the anguish of the troubled heart. Or my time spent minoring in philosophy as an undergrad, asking Kierkegaard's question whether it is in fact anxiety that makes us human. Kierkegaard writes, an adventure that every human being has to live through, learning to be anxious so as not to be ruined either by never having been in anxiety or by sinking into it. Whoever has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. Well, despite an almost continuous mumbling of the Hail Mary as I was growing up, I think I learned to be anxious in most of the wrong ways. I remember this Christmas midnight mass where I'd been chosen to carry the porcelain bisque-fired baby Jesus that had been handcrafted in Poland. Handcrafted in Poland, which explains why the baby Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes, right? So, I'm carrying the porcelain, white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby Jesus. I look up, and there's the blessed mother, like a bat signal, warning me not to drop him. <laughs> which is exactly what I was thinking when I tripped. Sending the baby Jesus flying into a pew, shattering into pieces. At that moment, all my Catholic anxiety fixed itself permanently in my brain. Immaculate conceptions, resurrections, Easter bunnies, transubstantiation, <laughs> masturbation. Yeah. Now, if you're raised Roman Catholic, I see Charles, I <laughs> if you're raised Roman Catholic, there's two things you can never forget. Well, there's two things I can never forget, right? One is my first experience with cannibalism, and the other is my first experience with death, and in my case, they happen to be connected, right? So, here's me in my little St. Mary's blazer and tie getting ready to make my first communion, which is the cannibal experience I mentioned, right? I mean, I pre-Vatican II, right? I'm taught about transubstantiation. The substance or reality of the bread is changed into that of the body of Christ and the substance of the wine into that of his blood while all else that remains accessible to the senses, right? Ah, try to figure that one out, right? Especially if you have my brain, right? So, First Communion Masses take forever, you know, but Communion time finally arrives. I'm first in the boys' row, and my friend Jimmy is right beside me. Jimmy is my best friend, even though he was a public school kid. And Kathy is first in the girls' row, and she's so 
beautiful in her white dress and veil. We arrive at the communion rail and kneel side by side like munchkins getting married in the land of Oz. I watch closely as each kid in my first communion class prepares to receive first holy communion. Body of Christ, Father John says to Kathy, I'm next. Jimmy leans in and whispers in my ear that his mouth is really dry and he doesn't feel well. And I tell him to be quiet before Father John hears him. I'm about to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. For real. And according to my National Geographic magazine, this will make me a cannibal. I was thrilled and petrified. <laughs> Bill, the body of Christ, says Father John. I stick my tongue out as far as I can without gagging, and I whisper, Amen, Father. He smiles and places the host on my tongue. I quickly cross myself, head back to my pew. Jimmy's right behind me, and I kneel, working up enough spit to deal with the host that's clinging to the roof of my mouth. When will I taste the flesh and blood? When will it swell and ooze? And will it taste like chicken? <laughs> Suddenly, I notice that Jimmy is fidgeting beside me. His hand is inside his mouth and he's trying to hide it, right? So, Jimmy, what's the matter? I ask and he ignores me, but he's really squirming now. Suddenly, Jimmy flicks something on the floor. I can't tell what it is at first, and then I see it. It's the host. Oh my God, oh my God, it's Jesus. <laughs> Jimmy, you just flicked Jesus on the floor. Are you crazy? It's Jesus. Man, this is serious. You got to pick it up and put it back in your mouth. Jimmy refuses. You gotta pick Jesus up off the floor and swallow him, man. Jimmy begs me to shut up, but all I can see is that wad of host on the floor and an image of Jimmy burning in hell, just like Sister Mary Mark said he would. <laughs> I couldn't just leave Jesus on the floor. I did, yeah. So I went back in after Mass and picked him up. I put him in my pocket. I had no idea what I was going to do with Jesus, right? But when I got home, I placed Jesus carefully in this little National Geographic box I had that originally held a piece of fool's gold, right? Six months later, Jimmy died. I told my mom I had to go see him. He was totally bald, looked like a little old man, but I knew it was him. I could tell by his hands. When no one was looking, I removed the dried, shriveled host from my pocket and I held it where Jimmy could see it. I put my left hand on his shoulder and I said, Jimmy, the body of Christ. Amen, I said on his behalf. Now, how many of you think Jimmy died because he spit Jesus on the floor? Right? That's what I thought for the longest time till I discovered that Jimmy died from leukemia. But even then, I wasn't convinced that some angry God hadn't done this. A light seen suddenly in the storm, snow coming from all sides like flakes of sleep, and myself on the road to the dark barn. Halfway there, a black dog near me from Robert Bly's Melancholia. You know, Winston Churchill often referred to his depression as the black dog. And apparently the image of the black dog as a potential reference for melancholy and depression goes back centuries. Samuel Johnson 
famous for the phrase, after writing it in a letter to a friend, what will you do to keep away the black dog that worries you at home? You see, I take comfort in the fact that the one thing we do know for certain is that somehow anxiety and depression made it through the evolutionary process. So there's a reason, right? And so many of our artists over time and thinkers have documented this for us. Ovid, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Van Gogh, Goya, Munch, Rothko, O'Keefe, Sylvia Plath, Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, just to name a few, helping us to think about these phenomena in more ways than just one. I'm still unraveling the links between all these possibilities and the ebb and flow of anxiety and depression that has accompanied me since my boyhood. But I reached a point recently, within the last year actually, right before I turned 60, where the ways I live with anxiety and depression, meditation, therapy, drawing, an incredible support system of family and friends, well, they just suddenly weren't enough. I needed help. And I felt ashamed. But my fear of madness outweighed the shame. And I started taking an antidepressant. The effect was slow, but significant. As I've aged, the weight of my unsorted baggage seems to have just gotten heavier and heavier. I built defenses to block things out, and those defenses slowly lost their effectiveness. The masks I wore and used to isolate myself from true feelings kept falling off. And finally, my body, my brain, my spirit said, it's time to pay up. So I've come to accept that anxiety and depression probably do live somewhere deep in the creases of my brain for whatever reason, maybe for all the possible reasons, right? An accumulation of life's events, a crack in my DNA, a collision on one of the neuronal highways in my brain, or as the, some of the most recent research suggests, maybe I've got bad gut bacteria, right? Or of living in such a toxic world. And though anxiety has often been front and center in my life, I've come to understand that depression clung to the far edges for as long as I can remember. My story, no one's story, is just a biomedical one, or just a psychological one, or a socioeconomic one, or a spiritual one. It's a human one which requires us to be connected. An explanation is not a cure, sadly, <laughs> but a diagnosis is not necessarily one's destiny. I've learned a lot of things about myself, doing the heavy lifting of working to live with anxiety and depression, but perhaps the most valuable lesson I've learned is why I'm an artist. I finally realized the gift of having found my path, my way to follow, and that I'm privileged to walk the path of an artist, sometimes alone, sometimes with company, with loss, with victories, some days it's easier to lean into the vulnerability of acceptance. But all the days, the good, the bad, the indifferent, the ones with losses, the ones with victories, and the one I'm sure won't happen tonight, a tie in overtime. <laughs> all those days are with me. In fact, they are me. And I'm learning to be with all of it because I think that may well be what it means to be human. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the website. If you want to write it down, you'll see there's a link on the, when you go to the website, there'll be a link for today, Huddle with the Faculty. And you can go right down to the comment section if you want to add comments, but you'll see other aspects of the project as well. So uh, the Q&A, yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, uh, and in fact, I, uh, part of my residency in the College of Nursing has been fortunate enough to work with three nurse researchers who do work on memory loss, Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, and, uh, and so we're just starting to collaborate on that because there, are, uh, there is some research that um, anxiety and depression can be markers for, might possibly be markers for Alzheimer's and for dementia in certain ways. So um, last year was my first year as an artist in residence in nursing and we're just sort of starting to collaborate in those ways. Actually using, uh, Charles, you'll, we're using story circles as a technique for dealing as, t for potentially creating arts-based interventions into patient care and so it's, uh, I'm hoping it's work that's going to grow significantly. Especially yes. <clears throat> between anxiety and depression. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, though. Great question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Bill. It's an absolutely brilliant inaugural lecture. It was just really quite wonderful. Uh, thank you. And thank you, and thank you for sharing it through your own personal story, which made it extraordinarily poignant and extraordinarily moving. I have two curveballs because you know yeah, that's what we do. That's what you do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, and and they're both kind of like political, socio-political uh, issues. One is with your Irish background. Have you looked into the tradition of keening as a response to the anxiety of social? Uh, depression, yes. and the other one is the most obvious for me, and that is the the uh, role of white supremacy in this entire process. That there is an imposed uh, yep. anxiety. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, the first one, um, I'm just starting to look at that to expand the kind of religion section of this work. Um, you know, particularly uh, Irish traditions of keening, but also prayer. You know, um, prayer as a form of managing, in fact, anxiety and other issues. Um, the white supremacy issue, absolutely. There's a whole section of this that breaks out into its own piece that I did at Dixon Place Theater in New York City just on toxic masculinity. Uh, and, it, and it goes right after white supremacy, um, after those kind of model, even the historical models, even the historical model of science. I don't want to open this really bad can of worms, but the history of science and the culture of science. I remember science gave us problem, the theories of miscegenation. Science is what gave us uh, you know, the, the tools to try and eliminate entire races of people. So there are, in fact, aspects of the project that I'm trying to bring together in like a separate talk, um, particularly in our current, I think, political world, I feel compelled as a cisgendered white man to speak out against those things and to perhaps provide some avenue for people to think about them in a new and different way. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your um, honesty and vulnerability. Um, I wondered um, what you see as the blessings of your anxiety and depression. Yeah, that took a while. <laughs> you know, for a good part of my life, I felt they were the curses of my existence, right? Um, but as, I, as my creative practice deepened as both a theater artist and a visual artist, all the drawings, by the way, are mine in the project. There's over, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and in fact, in a couple of weeks, Cleaver Magazine, which is a literary magazine out of Philadelphia, is publishing the, a version of the Dear Family and Friends letter. 
uh, will be in Cleaver Magazine. But as my creative practice deepened, both as a theater artist and a visual artist and a performance artist, I started to see that some of the aspects of, of OCD that I struggle with, that um, worrying about things going right, I mean, that you, if you can harness that energy, it does deepen your focus as an artist. When they become distractions, it's a problem. But when those things help me deepen my focus, even if I feel a, a depressive episode coming on, learning now through meditation and through drawing as a form of meditation to allow myself to be with what's happening and to accept it is a strength now for me. Um, and I think that's another area of research that I hope to go into. There's a lot of uh, there are a lot of assumptions made about artists and creative people and mental health. I think some of them may um, be valid assumptions, and, but very few of them have been researched, right? And then there's a lot of research that happens after the fact. Oh, now someone will look at Van Gogh's paintings and say what was wrong with him, but he's dead, right? And so that kind of speculative, speculative research can be really problematic for artists because it often adds to the stigma, right? But I do think that there is... If, if you're willing to be completely open and creative and vulnerable, these are some of the risks for people like me, right? But it's about learning to be with the risk as well as be with the benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have time for one more question over here. Yeah. <laughs> me, okay. I'll just... <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I really found it very interesting. And um, I don't know whether we should really end on my question, which is not frivolous, but uh, not weighty. And the question is whether you have a favorite day of the week, and if so, which one and why? Huh. <laughs> now that's a curveball. <laughs> but I think it is a great glass question. Um, hmm. I'm just going to go with my gut reaction, and I'm going to say today, Saturday, because, um, and this will be <laughs> a really, uh, it'll maybe an answer that throws you for a loop, but um, on Saturdays, in fact, as soon as we're done here, I'm changing my clothes, and I'm going up to the Home Depot to work a farmer's market with my daughter, who manage, who is married to and then manages a 500-acre farm that sells local food. And on Saturdays, I get to spend four hours with my daughter because she works so hard on the farm. She's up at four and in bed at seven. So I look forward to Saturdays where we hang out at the farmer's market together. So yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Second. Um, Please join me in thanking uh, Bill for his presentation. Thank you.